Thanks again. I do know it was time consuming and the people really liked being able to reach past the language barrier like that. He has a lot of intriguing work from the study of other humanoids like dwarves and elves to those ancient vehicle tracks he's found. It was a real pleasure just to be a part of that. And it's awesome to have you back. We decided to do this now because you just came back from doing some field research in Italy, which you're going to be making a documentary about soon. But tell us about that trip. Why Italy? Why Italy? Because it is literally full of ruins. Hmm. They are in everybody's uh, backyard. That is uh, especially in the area north of Rome where we spent 10 days. In certain areas, even most of the modern roads are built on the top of rock-cut roads left by this ancient civilization. Almost everybody who has a garden has this type of uh, ruins in their home. Hmm. Very few of them are labeled as historic sites because it's uh, so many thousands of them. <laughs> Just the sheer amount of ruins made me go there. And um, what I was uh, asking myself is why do they look the same as uh, similar rock ruins that are found in a belt uh, stretching from China to Portugal in great concentration and even possibly on other uh, continents, South and North America, Indonesia, Japan. But those are more isolated cases, but this belt is just full of them. So that's what made me go there, and I don't regret for doing so. <laughs> yeah, I saw the trailer that you laid out, and it looks like there's quite a few things, like uh, ancient garages. There's also this area that looks like it's been bored out that you could almost park a train in. Pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the association that everybody in the group could make when we saw them. They were just long and dark and all of them with uniform cuttings on the floor, like the floor was recessed and there were quite few of them. So since we saw so many garages already, this could not be an ordinary garage anymore. So this must have been for the trains. <laughs> and do we find those same type of tracks in Italy too? Oh, yes, Italy is full of tracks, definitely, and very unusual markings, uh, tracks. And uh, just a few days ago, I saw the photos from the newly discovered field in Turkey, and over there, I, I see the same strange tracks. Hmm. <laughs> so who do you think is responsible for these ruins or the structures that you found? Is there any way to say or get any kind of insight into who they might have been? Yes, I can definitely say for sure that there was a single civilization. It has uh, distinctly at least two layers, one of them much older, or two groups of layers, even maybe that much. But the older one definitely stretches at least from China to Portugal, and the somewhat younger looking one stretches all the way from like Jordan and the Middle East to Spain and Portugal. Who has built that? We don't even have a name for this civilization because nobody bothered to study it so far. Hmm. The mainstream historians, it doesn't fit into the picture they have been preaching, so they are not interested. We saw uh, how they even uh, have destroyed ruins, uh, valuable and very interesting ruins from this civilization, so they are not interested in it. Then uh, ordinary people, they are just uh, practically, they are not noticing them. We had a local guide, Simon, he, he is a viewer of my channel, and he first got in touch with me when I announced the Italy expedition, and he lived right in the heart of this region. And the, in the first email, he wrote me, I think you will be disappointed. I think you're talking about these holes that we used to store our garden tools in. <laughs> and after that, um, I mentioned to him a few interesting places. And when he went and visited, he was shocked himself what he discovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's impressive. There's also, I think, uh, is, was it that video where you found tunnel systems that were too small and narrow to have been built by humans? 
Now that's something else. That's uh, this one at least has a name. It's called um, Erdstahl. That's the single Erdstelle plural in German. They have a German name because they are mostly in uh, German-speaking regions like Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Now those are very similar to these uh, ruins that I'm talking about, and they probably could be classified as one of the uh, later layers of this enormous rock cutting that has been going on in antiquity, which the, the most amazing of everything, uh, according to everybody in the group, is the amount of ruins. Hmm. Many millions of people must have been I in this civilization. It's not something uh, uh, small. Yeah, It's just uh, everywhere. I, I mean, uh, even as you drive... On, on the sides of the road, everybody, everywhere, hewn stones, right angles, just everywhere. <laughs> right, and that is one of the major points here. It's kind of what you're contending, is that these remnants of ancient civilization are all over Italy, in the cities, in the backyards, along the roads, and people don't even realize what they're seeing. But you recognize the same cuts and styles all over the place, and it's indicative of a lost, far-reaching culture, hidden in plain sight. And seeing the ruins, you do make a great case. And one example you show in the footage is a picture of what's described as a Roman-era gate, but it's clearly patched into a much older wall, and it makes for a good example of this obscurification of history, doesn't it? Yeah, you're talking about the amphitheater in Sutri, right? Yes. The, before uh, visiting, I was always under the impression that the Roman-looking gate was added afterwards. I don't know why I thought like that. <laughs> but when I was there, I was looking and carefully at it, and then I noticed actually this gate is kind of geopolymer with lines drawn on it. And then I asked the lady who was the who was uh, the tour guide over there, and she said, oh, no, no, this full gate was added by the restoration team. I was shocked. This, <laughs> this is obvious forgery. They have just put the full Roman thing to, to make it look Roman. And I was like, really? I was so surprised. I, I asked her openly, how could they do that to, to put such a Roman patch on this old amphitheater. And she was uh, looking at me with questionable eyes. She says, what do you mean? But this is a Roman amphitheater. I said, what do you mean it's Roman amphitheater? You have thousands of, uh, in this very archaeological park, you have thousands of what you call Etruscan and necropolises. It's another question if they are such indeed, but you call them Etruscan necropolises. And this is clearly a part, it's, it's in the same style, it's with same age, there is no doubt it's part of it. I mean, the necropolises were on, on, on its walls. <laughs> so I'm, I asked her, how can you call this uh, amphitheater Roman if it's obviously not Roman? Well, she said, you know what? They must have hired local workers and they made it in their own style. <laughs> you mean the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. It just seems like it all, the story unravels when you start asking just a couple of questions. But I uh, heard something else, another piece of information, much more precious from this very same lady, who was actually very sincere. She openly spoke with me without, uh, because other tour guides, if you start asking too many questions, they feel personally offended, but this one was very sweet, actually. So she was sharing uh, with us, and she mentioned that uh, she works at uh, this archaeological park since year 2001. And uh, she remembers clearly that when she started working, the steps of the amphitheater were much sharper. So even within such a short span of time, they have eroded so much. And this confirms once again what I have been already suggesting in uh, older videos, that um, erosion is much, much uh, faster than uh, usually people are led to believe by a mainstream geology. Right, and that gets into the point that 
I mean, of course, we've talked about the fact that you can't really trust the dating methods that the establishment relies on, but it seems like your opinion is that they're much younger in, in a lot of cases than we're told, as opposed to the alternative, which usually says that they're far, far older. Uh, yes. Um, now, another conclusion, very important one that uh, I made after this expedition, and that will sound absolutely revolutionary probably to many listeners, is about the age of these famous uh, polygonal megaliths because we saw them as well in uh, Antica Norba and in um, Amelina. They have uh, gigantic uh, polygonal walls, quite uh, huge blocks, uh, almost uh, human size, hmm. uh, one of them. And, you know, it's it's very different when you visit and you see the ruins in their natural environment. So in this case, I must say that um, both mainstream historians and alternative ones, I think, are severely mistaken with their age. Hmm. I didn't have any prejudice how old are they. In the past, I always said I really don't know, but now I do have an opinion. And I will tell you what it is based on. I saw really old stuff. I saw how it looks. It is buried with clay. It bears uh, little connection with the current ground level. Huge blocks turned over, severe erosion. This thing, this, all these things that I just listed, they're not very well visible on the huge polygonal megaliths. They're very near to the current street level. They're uh, relatively well preserved while the older rocket stuff that lays next to them and is made of the very same stone under the same conditions is much, much more eroded. So I can tell you for sure that these things are not, uh, what to speak of 12,000 years old. Just by the looks, I would tell that they are older than 1,000 years. Hmm. This is from the looks only. Otherwise, uh, taking into consideration other factors, I would say maximum couple of thousand years. Wow. Yeah, you really bring that stuff forward. And I have heard you put it that anything older than 200 years in, in terms of our history is highly questionable. Anything older than 500 is probably pure fantasy. And that probably sounds uh, pretty far <laughs> out for some people. But could you paint us a picture of what you think might have been going on six or 700 years ago? Oh, well, well, maybe at that time they were building these megaliths. Also, once I saw this situation, overall situation with how young they look, uh, then I also, other things started coming up in my mind. I also realized that the alternative researchers, they look at them taken out of context. They uh, show you a, a really magnificent polygonal wall in uh, Peru. And they tell you, you see, this could not have been built by the Incas with their primitive bronze tools. Actually, we don't have any reliable information about the Incas. We are told that it was based on the first documents of the colonizers. Those documents were never published. They are locked until now. They were not published when they were written, why they were hiding them. People must have been interested at that time. America was discovered, why they were hiding them from the very beginning. None of them are available in original, and uh, some of them are not even available in edited form. Hmm. So it's uh, absolutely uh, unfair to base their dating to say they're older than the Incas because the Incas had only primitive tools. How do we know what tools the Incas have? Also, we find other types of skeletons um, over there with red hairs, elongated, non-human looking. How do we know what kind of tools those beings had? And they are not uh, those funny skulls. They are not much, much older. So I don't see any problem because you're asking about the time period of five or six or seven hundred years ago. Maybe those beings were building together with the local people, maybe in Peru and everywhere else, these polygonal walls. I don't see any problem with that because the same, for example, elongated skulls, are found in Europe as well. It's it's just a hypothesis. I'm not saying particularly there is any connection between the elongated skulls and the uh, polygonal uh, megalithic walls, but it's uh, just an option. Uh, also, 
uh, this dating that I'm saying that they are very young is uh, based on the fact that they are taken out of context, not not uh, like in their entirety. The researchers who talk about 12,000 years ago, they don't take into consideration that we have such a walls incorporated into medieval fortresses in Japan, in Europe. The French uh, uh, aqueducts, they are also relatively very, very young, just a couple of hundred years ago, or what to speak of St. Petersburg. The megaliths there are huge, very similar to those of Peru, like identical looks built a few hundred years ago. And Armenia, in Armenia, also we have amazing uh, polygonal stuff, very hard stone. How did they put it? And it's not just one place, it's a couple of them over there in Turkey, in Armenia. So when we say the date for 12,000 years, we should not exclude all this other stuff. And then we can get the correct idea of everything. Mm -hmm. So last time we talked and we discussed the elite changing, altering the timeline, restructuring our human history to fit what they want us to know and what justifies their rule. And that's a pretty radical idea that a lot of people were super interested in. But the biggest criticism that people came back at me with was looking at the history of inventions and tools, like from the wheel up to vehicles and rockets and the Internet that we have now. It's easy to kind of trace that history, and it's hard to you know, undo that in our heads because when we look at these sites that we're talking about, these megalithic sites, they require some high technology to put them together, and we don't find buried cranes anywhere from 700 years ago. We don't find vehicles that might have made tracks in the mud. So I'm curious what you think about that, like how we, how we solve that problem. Um. I think, first of all, people are a, a bit uh, with narrow vision because they always expect higher technology to be very technical, like ours. Mm -hmm. uh, while in most cases, probably it was sound-based in the past. And why I say sound-based, it's uh, because of the legends we always hear about the magical words, how they do things with that. And also with my experience with shamanic things, with sounds, this is the way to do miracles. This is the main way to do miracles. So they could have been using far more advanced techniques than we can imagine, for example, based on sound, and they wouldn't require all of these cranes and stuff. That's the first thing. Mm. Second of all, I don't think that most of these, uh, for example, the polygonal masonry megaliths uh, required uh, cranes or these uh, advanced cutting machines simply because they were cast out of geopolymer. Mm -hmm. There is really overwhelming evidence of this coming from many sites. N not only one researcher, there is pretty convincing evidence that that has been the case mostly. Which is like advanced concrete for people who don't know, right? Yeah, advanced advanced concrete. For example, in Peru, we have a lot of cuttings on solid, massive bedrocks that could not have been cast out. And over there we see cutting marks that are absolutely smooth. Now, this may make some people think that they must have used some very advanced cutting machines. But again, this is not the only option. What about this stone melting with sound? It's just one possibility. I'm not saying that they did it in that way. I have no proof, no reason to think so. But on, the only thing I'm saying, there are other options. Mm -hmm. So our style of technology is not the only possible one. This is uh, my main answer. And the second possibility is that um, if these amazing things in the past were done with technical tools similar to ours, then it is possible that only a small fraction of the society had such tools or access to them. Mm -hmm. As it is nowadays, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> very true. So if the machines were very few, 
then it's not difficult that uh, we don't find them. Mm -hmm. No wonder that we don't find them. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not saying that any of this hypothesis is true. The only thing I'm trying to prove is that there are other options. I'm with you. The lack of cranes doesn't uh, prove that uh, it was only aliens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are fair points. And as far as the actual tools that were used, the tools that produced those um, two marks that seem above our technology, for example, a circular disc with diameter of two, three meters and yet only a couple of millimeters wide. This is far above us. We don't have a material from which we could make such a disc. It would break with the first rotation if we try to. So recently in a rational laboratory, they examined some of the stones that had on them tool marks of such advanced machinery. They carefully compared them with the marks left by modern circular discs, stone cutting machines. And the conclusion was that the marks left by the old cutting instrument are so fine and they leave such a smooth surface that as if though the stone was not cut using gross material force as our cutting machines, but as if it was disintegrating the material as it goes, as if it was cutting through butter. So the fact that on some old stones we see tool marks that somewhat resemble the tool marks left by current machinery, that should not make us automatically assume that the tools were also like ours. For example, a stone cutting machine with disc, well, with a bit better specifications, but still something similar, an improved model. No, there is no reason to think that it was simply an improved model. Well, at the same time, we do have old descriptions of cutting discs. The name of one of them would be Sudarshana Chakra from the Vedic literature. It is used as a weapon as well and uh, as many other things by Vishnu, Krishna and other incarnations of the underlying creator spirit of goodness. And so Sudarshana Chakra would travel great distances in no time and perform all kinds of tasks and nowhere there is any mentions of uh, cables hanging from it. Just on the opposite, it is clearly said it operated with the power of wish, with the power of thoughts, the power of will. Even primitive chaps like us have detected in our laboratories that thoughts do have the power to produce purely material impulses in matter, electromagnetic in nature, so we shouldn't be surprised at all if a disk operates powered by thought. In the book of Enoch there are also some descriptions for some sort of old magical machinery and there is no mention at all that it needed the electric power supply or some sort of uh, gigantic uh, metal structures to support or move the giant stones it was uh, working with. Yet it easily handled, with the power of magic only, absolutely massive stones. Uh, for example, the huge megaliths at the basis of uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem seem to have been built with the help of such uh, machinery. Sure enough, the reality corresponds to the old book. There is a visibly distinct older layer in the Temple Mount, and it does consist of such uh, gigantic stones that uh, happen to have this uh, techno look, so to say. And uh, needless to say, it was all powered again by magic. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. We have to think unconventionally and respect some of those descriptions we find in those old texts. And if we're talking about the period of the Reformation, this 1500s era as the point when these parasites, as you say, took over, 
Well, that's right in line with the invention of the printing press, the first technology to facilitate the widespread distribution of information. And every other iteration, newspapers, radio, TV, film, it's always been distributed from the top with plenty of indications that deception and propaganda was used in these mediums from the get-go. Why should the printing press have been any different? And you can almost say that from the shutting down of magic back in the day, and this point where you have the iteration of the printing press right on up to the modern internet, these are the technologies of the parasites and some of the next best options that emerge once the original, more Earth-based technologies that we were using for however many years were removed. Uh, yes, I get your point. Uh, Fomenko also uh, makes the point that when they started printing, Immediately they started with like very large volumes, like four bricks put together <laughs> this big. It, it, there was no gradual evolution. And immediately they started to, uh, one abbey printed 100 volumes of something, the other one 200 of history, and the other one 200 more. It wasn't a gradual uh, evolution. So what I find very interesting is um, the... A way of distributing information in the past according to the description in the Vedas. They talk about times when uh, people needed to hear a given book only once and then they would memorize every single word of it forever. Hmm. So that kind of memory we had thousands of years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and then we evolved to <laughs> what we are now <laughs> right devolved down yeah. you you were talking about that 12,000 years ago time period that very trendy time period in the alternative culture right now and a lot of the center of that is Gobekli Tepe and one thing I find interesting is that it's sort of common knowledge that Gobekli Tepe was intentionally buried but researchers seem to treat that like it's some big mystery you know why would they do this but if a parasitic elite was trying to cover up the past, it seems pretty clear why someone might bury a, a site like Gobekli Tepe. Yes, I do agree with you. But in terms of uh, the popularity of uh, Gobekli Tepe, it has gained lots of popularity recently. And that's great because we have some examples of art that could be very, very old. Possibly the site is really old. Or to be more precise, the older layer with the dinosaur carvings and the T-shaped stones, that could be somewhat old. While the other layer that consists of uh, primitive stonework, basically, mostly of undressed stones going in circle and connecting the bigger T-shaped blocks, that seems... Probably very, very recent to me. It could be even medieval. At least its style resembles that of the Roman and medieval times. And not only it belongs to a distinctly different style of a building, but also this primitive stone work often overlaps the depictions on the old stone of figures of animals which definitely suggests that uh, these uh, circular walls were not part of the initial design. But also we should not forget that uh, Gebekli Tepe has acquired its recent uh, fame due to mainstream historical dating, which uh, again and again has uh, turned out to be total joke and lies, sometimes, sometimes clear fraud, we can only make guesses about the age of uh, Quebec to Tepe. It could be old or not. But very few people are aware that we have historic sites that are not very famous and are definitely much more impressive and much, much older. Some examples would be the numerous rock-cut ruins near Atlit in Israel or Sierra de San Cristobal in Spain or the Egil castles of Turkey. Now, why am I so confident that they are much, much older? For example, Atlit. 
those ruins are cut out of solid bedrock. In some cases, that bedrock is a very hard variety of stone. So partially, of course, they are covered with soil, but at places they were exposed. And over there, you can clearly see how parts of the buildings, part of the walls, have been eaten up by erosion. And they are smoothened in such a way that it is absolutely crystal clear that it is not that some chunk of the wall fall in earthquake. It was only erosion, most definitely. Now, in reality, if we have to be honest, we have absolutely no clue what is the speed of erosion even. The mainstream estimations are total fantasy. But we can make a very important parallel with the Peruvian polygonal megaliths, for example, because some of them are also made of a very hard variety of granite. Now, those megaliths have been exposed to the weather at least for couple of thousand years, at least 500 years, let's say, if not much, much longer, which is also possible, and still they look brand new, as if built yesterday. On most of the famous Peruvian polygonal megaliths, the visible signs of erosion are simply not there. So just imagine, in relation to that, how long would have been at least rock cut ruins exposed to the weather so that entire parts of the wall, in some cases a few meters high, would get eaten up by the erosion. And when I say rock cut ruins, please don't imagine some sort of a grotto like those of the primitive men of Stone Age, as we are showed, like Fred and Barney. I'm talking about uh, absolutely massive walls the height of a few stories, maybe 10 meters high. And then in Spain we have Sierra de San Cristobal, which is um, made in a style absolutely identical to that of the ruins of Atlit. Same 6-10 meters high walls that appear to be remains as if they were surrounding some sort of assembly halls or maybe gardens, but probably not because uh, also underground there are vast halls with very high ceilings. And all that stretches for many square kilometers is just absolutely vast and huge. It's close to the public. Access is uh, difficult or impossible, also very deep shafts. And even if you get inside, if you attempt to get to the really big portions of the underground parts of it, and then sooner or later you see a modern wall just uh, cutting your access off. So what uh, I want to say is I'm not saying that there wasn't advanced civilization 12,000 years ago, but they were not building polygonal megaliths for sure. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, we mentioned earlier, just to, just so everybody's clear, we mentioned earlier that some of these sites that are, were told are thousands of years old might actually only be hundreds of years old. What do you think the oldest structures that we can see are? How old do you think the oldest ones might be that we can see? Oh, I have no clue, but the ones I mentioned uh, in Israel could be uh, the oldest I can think of right now. They look similarly eroded to these Egil castles of Turkey and all these rock ruins that belong to the same. Uh, the Egil castles, they belong to the style that I was researching in Italy and in Spain. And the those in Israel are slightly different. But the, the Israeli ones could be a bit older because some of them are made of very hard variety of stone. While um, in Turkey and in Italy, uh, they were mostly cut into tufa stones, which means compressed, hardened um, volcanic ash. Okay. So that's sometimes very soft. Right on. So it's it's very hard to put any kind of date on these things because there's really no dating method that you would really trust that's out there, right? 
I, I trust a, a certain dating method, but <laughs> I can't find enough people to extract information about it. Hmm. Uh, as I have said many times, the way to find out our true history is uh, through trans states. Uh, the easiest uh, available way to do it now, see, available method to do it nowadays are the past life regressions. If uh, regressionists from all over the world um, gather together and start recording pieces of history told by their clients, we can uh, recover the true history very quickly mm -hmm. because uh, when unrelated people from different continents start telling a story about certain historic event, then most likely that's how it was. It is very easy to recover our history. It's just a question of making the people aware how to do it and then doing it. <laughs> well, I know that you're also very well-versed in ayahuasca and the spiritual realm and communicating with entities that might be on that side. Have you talked to any entities that might give you insights into the past, like Shiva or some of the other ones I've heard you mention before? <laughs> no, <laughs> unfortunately... I don't feel I'm very well versed in these things. That's the main <laughs> problem. And that's why I need to go on expeditions <laughs> to uh, try uh, to find out, find out the truth. No, I have never spoken with uh, any entity regarding history. I have had a couple of very brief historic visions. And... Um, I'm not as good in ayahuasca as I should be. I'm excellent compared to the average level <laughs> of, on earth now. Then you can say I'm very well worse. But otherwise, I think I know nothing about it, unfortunately, <laughs> from my perspective. Understood. You're being pretty humble, of course, but you do plan to continue down the path of ayahuasca insights and experiences, right? I mean, maybe in some type of teaching capacity? Yes, uh, this is how I envision my old age when I'm 70 or 80, just uh, conducting ceremonies. What else to do? You know, old people, they don't require so much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right. But in terms of uh, plans for the foreseeable future... Some um, friends of mine are actually trying to open a fully legitimate um, ayahuasca center here in the so-called advanced world. And if that uh, happens, I will be glad to join them and help. Not necessarily in a capacity of a shaman, because uh, being a shaman is not as uh, glamorous and... Um, exotic job as it may seem to many people. To some it may seem to be only about uh, smoking aromatic herbs in a fancy pipe and chatting casually with angels fluffing their wings around you. Uh, but uh, this is uh, so far from the truth. This line is thinking is like that of a person who thinks, oh, I will become a surgeon so that I can watch naked chicks all my life. You will be seeing something radically different on the surgical table all your life if you become a surgeon. And in a similar way, becoming a shaman means daily encountering, dragging out of people the ugliest and most nasty creatures that you can't even see in this world. But I do believe that uh, making ayahuasca available for everybody who wishes that is probably the fastest way to raise the level of the consciousness of the planet. I'm not saying ayahuasca is the only spiritual practice or that it is the best spiritual practice. But I definitely think it is the one that delivers the fastest results. For example, you may go to some uh, Buddhist uh, gathering or seminar or uh, yoga, something of that sort, and they will tell you that you are a particle of this underlying creator spirit and that if you conduct your daily activities from this point of view, instead of the egoistic one that is always profit-oriented, 
Then gradually your consciousness will be emancipated. It will be, but it will take ages, because after this seminar you will return home and you, you are likely sooner or later to face problems like uh, having to go to unpleasant work for many hours. Then you start thinking, where is this underlying creator spirit? If he was so full in love and I'm a particle of him, how come I ended in this unpleasant situation and why doesn't the spirit come to help me pay my rent so that I can find some time and meditate on him? And so one would slide back in the modern so-called normal way of life, which is full of sadness, depression, bitterness, arrogance, disappointment, and so on. But Ayahuasca is a radically different type of teacher. It will not give you lectures, nor it will tell you what to do. It will simply take you by the hand and show you in absolutely straightforward and practical terms that you are an infinite spirit made of love. For many people this would happen within the first few ceremonies, others may need much more sessions, but eventually it does happen to everybody. And then as the student of Ayahuasca perceives more and more how his own being is woven from this material, this underlying goodness. One doesn't need to be told how to change one's ways and behavior and intentions and priorities. It happens automatically. It's just a normal sequence of understanding who you are. Now and then I get a letters of concern from some of the viewers of my YouTube channel. They would go like this. I love your historic videos, but I'm concerned about your soul because you drink ayahuasca and evil spirits are talking to you. Yes, I absolutely guarantee and confirm this and tell this openly. If you drink ayahuasca sooner or later, you are sure to meet one spirit, evil spirit, most probably it will be very evil, and I can tell you who it is exactly. That's your own dark side. And as far as our dark side, I'm aware of only four options. The first one is to face it, understand what does it feed on, and then dissolve it by giving it no more food and transforming yourself into angel. The second option is to know that you have a dark side, but to be afraid to face it. The third one is out of stupid pride to convince yourself that you do not have any dark side at all. And the fourth one is to actually embrace it and lead some sort of devilish existence even while you're in a human form. <laughs> Damn, that is interesting. I guess we all have a dark side we're going to have to do something with, ayahuasca or not. And another tool for insight into the true history that you had mentioned last time was remote viewing. Have there been any advancements on that front at all since we last talked? I'm still trying hard. I'm left uh, only with one uh, remote viewer, Mike uh, Herberts. He's a good, good uh, viewer. Just a few days ago, I gave him a target. It's now revealed, so I can tell you. It was the these uh, high towers in Tibet. Mm, right on. So I'm just giving you an example of uh, how is our remote wing project going on. And he got back to me. He described uh, Lhasa very well. He even mentioned that these are the people of Tibet. He was so close to the target. Hmm. He described the village and everything, but he never saw the towers. <laughs> wow. Uh, so uh, definitely remote viewing can be of use, but with one person, I can still do relatively very little. I was feeling as if he's uh, watching from the towers, so he sees everything else around himself. <laughs> <laughs> Very well could be. And you mentioned past life regressionists. I know you interviewed Peter Petrov, a uh, past life regressionist from Bulgaria, and I really liked that interview. And with this reconstruction, what sorts of insights have you gotten from his work into people's past lives? Are there certain patterns that are forming or certain uh, revelations people have said about their past lives that you found particularly insightful? Particularly insightful? I don't have new information from him, but I remember, for example, other past life regressions I have read, 
for example, some lady was recollecting how probably 1,000 years ago, I'm 99% sure, mm -hmm. she was whatever, sister of a priest, high priest in Egypt. And even as close as 1,000 years ago, they were uh, having that high magic or technology, I don't know if you can call it that way, yeah. that they were trying to even resurrect dead people to put them back in, back in their bodies. Mm. <laughs> they were, um, at least those who were educated, the priests, they could uh, go in and out of their body at will. And the main thing about these past life regressions is what was important for the people in the past. It wasn't so much the cell phones and gadgets. That's why we have difficulty understanding and we tend to make wrong guesses about how and why things were because we have absolutely different priorities compared to them. We don't understand their mindset. That is the main problem. Mm -hmm. Once uh, we start understanding what is spirituality, because from my point of view, people don't even know what is spirituality all about. Some think it's some uh, faith in fantasy or believing in ghosts or believing in something. It's actually spirituality is understanding who you are, what is your soul. But uh, people have not only turned away from it, they don't even know what is it <laughs> nowadays. So I think when we start understanding what it is and start feeling that it is interesting, then the history may open for us. Right. Very well could be. And I also wanted to talk to you about the evidence for ancient wars or really powerful weapons and the destruction of areas, because this is talked about sometimes in alternative circles, and usually they cite the sand glass as possible evidence of this. But I've heard critics say that a meteor could also cause that to form. But there are other pieces of evidence of ancient weaponry used outside of that, right? Uh, can I answer from a very high perspective mystical one? Please. <laughs> you know, even when a comet falls, this can be a weapon itself. Mm. Because um, in the, the way the gods were fighting, even according to legends, they would uh, throw celestial bodies or gods or demons. It's maybe a, a more suitable word. The demons would throw entire celestial bodies at our planet. Mm. And in addition to that, everything is uh, penetrated by this all-pervasive consciousness. Even the meteor is not dead. Mm. Well, that's a fair point. As hard as it might be to attribute damage to either a natural disaster or a technological weapon of some kind... It might not even matter if you think everything has consciousness and there are unseen forces influencing events. It gets almost impossible to separate the two. But in terms of the evidence of some kind of weapon, there are areas like the old Indus Valley civilization that I've heard you talk about where it looks like many people died suddenly in mass in the streets where skeletons are preserved huddled up as if they were running from something that wiped them all out. And that's pretty odd, wouldn't you say? Yeah, probably it was a result of some weapon because uh, that's what we read in the history of that region. Actually, that region has a remarkably well-preserved written history, the Vedic literature. So over there, the finds perfectly correspond to the history of the region. Those who consider it to be a fantasy and legend, that's their problem. <laughs> I see no uh, no ambiguity over there. Everything fits perfectly. Another one I really liked that was new to me that I learned about in your videos was the lake of Svitjas, I think if I'm pronouncing it right. The local legend said there was a city there, but now there's just a lake. Yeah, this is, this is how we'll find our history. So this boy, he's not even into history. He's just uh, developing his mystic powers. He sees things in dreams. He had some feeling inside, feeling that there was a town here, some feelings. He saw some people uh, screaming and this and that. 
and he went to the museum and he found out that indeed there was a town here on the old maps and the people disappeared under a suspiciously round hole and then the local legends say that after this happened anybody who went to that wretched place and touched anything there was also getting very sick and dying and the symptoms were um, very similar to those of somebody who would have been in contact with radiation so this is really a superb example of how we can of how even non-historians discover pieces of the history yeah i love that it's like we need to trust our modern shamans but that lake story was so interesting because apparently old maps don't have the lake there they actually have the city and all the surrounding areas are as they're thought to be and apparently this was two or three hundred years ago that some of these maps have a city there and that really does kind of give credence to your position that a lot of these ruins or the destruction of cities wasn't as far back as people say yes and now to return back to the italy expedition a very perplexing uh, thing for all of us who were there, we were like 12, 13 people, is um, these rock ruins, we consider them, uh, they look pre flood because they're multi-storied often, and entire stories of them are just clogged with, with clay, covered with earth layers. Hmm. It's not some sort of a historic, uh, what they call it, uh, cultural layers with some ceramic. It's just pure clay a few meters high hmm. on one side, which looks like great flood to me. And we saw this all over. And yet, on the other hand, the two marks on many of them were very, very fresh. And this is on a relatively soft variety of stone. This is very perplexing, actually. And not only they look pre-flood, but also like these streets, these rock-cut streets, in many cases, they end abruptly at very high cliffs. And below are forests and valleys and villages, medieval villages. So, obviously, these are very old ruins from the destruction of how the earth layers were turning. And on the other side, on the sides of these rock streets, which were uh, not, uh, uh, which were used for a long time, which are even still in use, we see very fresh cutting tool marks. Hmm. This is quite mysterious. And that is on soft stone. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. It is a lot. And, you know, we were talking about um, the idea of massive destruction. I have speculated. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on it. But I wonder if the recovery of ancient weapons or lost knowledge could be the reason why there's still all this fighting for control of the Middle East in modern times. Might there be secrets still left uncovered or potentially technology or weaponry, even if it's just things that are written about. I wonder if that isn't part of the subtext for why there's so much fighting with the superpowers over that region. Could be, but I don't have any information about this. <laughs> fair, fair. And on this kind of same theme of destroyed cities and cultures we know nothing about, I've heard you say that the biggest country that seems to have been removed from history entirely is one called Tartaria, if I'm pronouncing it right, that is somewhere in modern Russia? Tartaria. Uh, yes, well, it was uh, much bigger initially. It was covering probably most of the earth in the beginning. And uh, later on, it got broken into pieces. Maybe Fomenko sees Russia as its center because he's a Russian himself. Mm. But uh, in reality, pieces of it uh, fought became independent under different names. Uh, some of them were in Patagonia, in Ethiopia, certainly in Siberia were some of them. They were fighting longer than the others. But yes, this, this country is on all 
all the maps. Its uh, flag is included in a number of medieval lists of flags. Mm. Uh, its uh, kings, uh, like the dynasties of its kings, are described in historic books. There is no reason to doubt that it was a country, and yet it's just uh, missing from the modern history textbooks. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so fascinating. I love that kind of mystery, and I mean, it does show that such a huge thing can be covered up and just removed from the culture entirely if they choose to do that. And I love also looking at ancient maps. We talked about several the last time you were here, but this is one of the best ways to learn about missing civilizations, right? Uh, yes, and particularly the maps of uh, the sailors, because the maps that were on land, they got mostly destroyed during the Reformation. But because uh, those who were carrying out the cleanup had, you know, it's practically difficult to go out in the seas and hunt the ships to search them for maps that's why the old navigation maps are most revealing <laughs> and i was also going to ask you if you've looked at uh, or if you've heard of friesland because i've had a few guests who have shown me some maps that have another land mass near iceland and greenland that had cities mapped out on it it had the capital on it and they called it friesland and it's just not there anymore friesland yeah uh, maybe you're not familiar. Maybe that's a new maybe, one. Maybe, maybe. I'll send maybe. you some links. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Man, I, I just, I really do love talking to you because you're a real gateway between the English speaking world and a lot of researchers that are kind of behind the language barrier, like Fomenko to a some degree and like Coltepin. And are there other researchers like them that don't reach American audiences that you're deriving a lot of uh, your research from that you could tell us about? Uh, yes, for example, this uh, boy Kuznetsov that uh, discovered these tracks in uh, near uh, Derenkuyu, the video I published a few days ago. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he's very nice. Oh, um, Subotin, Nikolai Subotin, he's also very, very uh, cool. <laughs> And of course, the king of all Russian researchers is um, oh, Vadim Chernobrov. Hmm. So Vadim Chernobrov, he is also very, very interesting, probably the most famous in Russia. But it's very strange. He makes expeditions and he does not publish the results. One needs to wait a few years for some... TV or radio interview hmm. to hear about fantastic stuff and then a couple of more years to get photos of it because he does not publish any of the photos on his website. I often wonder why is he doing all this research. <laughs> but the things he discovers are really fascinating and uh, he's very, very meticulous in his study. No speculation, no strange stuff. He's really very good. Hmm. But in Chernobyl. Interesting. I will look him up. Another thing that came up in the Coltipin interview and some of your work is the idea of non-humans living in the past. You found several structures that seem to have been elf castles. At least that's what you're referring to them as, right? Yeah, the elf castles. Now this is interesting and new. The elf castles... The Coltipin came up with this name because they look uh, magical as if taken out from a fairy tale. But I think well, actually they were for humans. Now, what I saw in Italy, one of these what I call layers of rock cut ruins because they belong to several groups. One of them just out there in the forest, they look as if really elves lived there. They have a particular flavor to them. They're like secluded, usually just one or two rooms with some very strange tunnels next to them or on the back side. Hmm. Always with fantastic views from the window and somewhat uh, low ceilings. And 
the, the, with this, the most cute steps on the side. If you go there, you will feel as if you're in a fairy tale. If I did not have a group with me of people who wanted to research history, I would just remain there and sing Om and not go <laughs> to other historic sites. We did some of that Om singing in the isolated caves. We had a very good uh, didgeridoo player in the group. It was truly magical. And then when you see this with the high trees around, with the Marita muscaria growing around, just the feeling was, I, I was surprised that one can visit a fairy tale, real one, so near to Rome. Hmm. And all this was found by our uh, local guide, Simon, who in the beginning was telling me that you will be disappointed by the holes where we keep our shovels. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was also impressed by the cave of swimmers in Egypt, where there's some curious rock art that depicts mermaids, it seems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that somebody submitted that to the directory. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you also have a video talking about, while we're on the subject of non-humans, dwarves living in Siberia not that long ago. And the people used to have regular communication and trade with them, apparently. What can you tell us about that? That's pretty far out for some people to hear, I think. Yes, when one spends one's life in a matchbox, <laughs> then... <laughs> An object like a car will seem so gigantic that it will be like a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> what else can I say? I'm sure that's true because I myself saw tunnels in Spain, in Austria, where they're, they're non-human. No, it's uh, it's no way you can pass through what to speak of shoveling stone or digging it. Mm. Well, I don't know what to, to recommend to people who cannot uh, imagine it just because it seems uh, so weird for them. <laughs> if they drink ayahuasca 100 times, that may help them. <laughs> I believe that. Uh, but ap apparently in this Siberian area, you say in the video that diplomatic connections between the dwarves and the humans was severed in the 18th century and obviously before that we traded with them we talked to them how do we know that connection was severed in the 18th century is that from the local people yeah that's from the local people yeah definitely and in the wild areas uh, these uh, tribes shoot there are a couple of them they're similar some of them were dwarves some were people that um, when we started going the technological way when they started changing a lot some certain groups of people decided not to go that way but remain in the wild not to lose their uh, magical powers and they started mixing with all these tribes that were still doing magic so who lives still in the tunnels we don't know but the source of this information the diplomatic uh, relations, so to say, I mean, just mm -hmm. exchanging messages about trading metal stuff. That is from the local people, yes, definitely. And those who lead more traditional life in these areas till nowadays, if you ask them, uh, these Chut tribes and others, these are dwarves. But if you read like um, mainstream books, they will tell you, oh, these were normal people. These were just the ancestors of the people that live there now. But if you go to the people that live there now, they will tell you, no, these are the dwarves. Sometimes they kidnapped our children to, uh, you know, take them. <laughs> they they uh, don't even like them very much. They feel offended when somebody suggests that these were their ancestors. No, these are our enemies. They were, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they were doing magic on us and things like that so that's interesting do we know uh, i guess we don't really know exactly why the connection was severed or do we have any of their any writing or anything from them uh writing from the dwarves yeah no we don't have writing but we, we have artifacts 
this kind of small iron, how you call them, pieces of art. Right, little uh, figurines. It looked like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, figurines. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, uh, That's all we have. Are we to assume that the dwarves are still alive somewhere underground? Yes. Uh, occasionally, there are meetings recorded that they may talk to people who, for example, hunters or some strange tourists who venture in really wild areas. Now and then, they will meet a dwarf. I also thought it was interesting that they say that they found some copper areas and they started developing copper mines and found out that th these mines had already been excavated and, and mined out a long time ago, probably by these dwarf civilizations. Yeah, that's what triggered these uh, actually scientific expeditions in Russia to Siberia. When they started developing their metal industry in the regions, the ore places were all already open. And so they gathered the best uh, scientists at that time in Russia and sent them on a couple of expeditions to find out what's going on there. <laughs> so they went and found out and wrote their reports. And fortunately, these reports are still available in some Russian universities. They are not taught as part of history, but some students fortunately had access to them, could read them, and that's how we could uh, find out about them. Yeah, I find that stuff really interesting because it's such evidence that somebody was there before and that they were there long enough ago that we don't even remember it, that it seems like completely foreign to us. And have you found anything else in the way of ancient quarries or advanced mining operations, anything like that that really seems like a big operation of high technology from the past that doesn't fit with the official story? Uh, so the best example, the most applicable site to this topic would be the Longyu Grottoes of China. That's their official name. Hmm. Just a couple of mountain peaks are literally made hollow inside, and the two marks on the walls are one-to-one, -one, same as our modern heavy equipment for mining. And officially they are declared a mystery, so problem is solved. Mm -hmm. They are opened uh, for public access. One can visit them, but that's it. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people looking into the idea of ancient quarries and stuff right now. I've had some people send me this video that is trying to make the case that the Grand Canyon is actually some ancient mining operation. And that's, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I don't know about the Grand Canyon, but what I found most intriguing is this um, in the Gulf of Mexico those um, strange marks on the bottom of the enclosed body of water. Hmm. I don't know if you saw them there in one of the episodes about what I call old earth ruins. Hmm. That is the most convincing one because it's on the bottom and uh, yeah. It's under the water. What else to say? Mm -hmm. deep underwater. And that's pretty common, too. I mean, pretty much across the coastlines of every major continent, we can find something that is right there under the water that suggests that at a previous time there was a civilization on the old coast that was right there. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty common. So another thing that you talk about fairly often is the idea that before the parasites, we were a much more cohesive species you know there was we were much more international and we had the kind of communication and travel that the mainstream says we didn't have they say we were all just isolated pockets and one piece of evidence that i just recently heard about from your videos is this runic writing that is apparently found in europe asia africa and in the americas to some extent you say they're officially labeled as independent systems to hide our you know one big family can you tell us anything more about this seemingly universal language or these these rune writings, these runic writings? I'm not sure. It doesn't really have an official name. In, in terms of runic, maybe it's pre-runic. 
the closest name that maybe some scholars try to put to it is pre-Sanskrit. That's uh, that would be the keyword hmm. for this type of uh, writing. It predates the runes. The runes are similar to it, but a later development of it. And definitely, uh, I showed uh, examples from Southeast Asia. Definitely, a lot of it in South and North America. Of course, tons of it in Europe and the Middle East. These artifacts, they are not. Um, Secret as such, their their existence is not disputed. They are found uh, all over museums and um, officially accepted historic sites, but simply nobody pays attention that uh, we have the same writing all over the place. How come? Yeah, that's the mystery. <laughs> but finding that, I mean, that really does help give credibility to this idea of a unified, peaceful past before a parasitic invasion and the Reformation period got us all out of whack. So hearing about that, it only strengthens the case. Interestingly enough, a um, similar type of uh, writing showed on the underwater video cams that were filming the pyramid of the coast of Cuba that is some 60 meters below sea level. And I found an interview that was uh, taken from the archaeologists that were conducting the research. And the interview was taken when um, this writing was first spotted. At that time, they were already talking about similarities to various ancient uh, European alphabets and so on, and connecting with uh, various uh, experts in um, languages in old languages but then uh, in the interviews that were taken from them the subsequent years they would uh, deny answering questions about this uh, writing they would just uh, skip the answers and uh, when pressed harder they would say the waters were murky we don't know who, what was it mm -hmm. it's exciting to tell you the truth and as we're getting ready to wrap this up i do love the crowdsourcing approach that you take at megaliths.org and you've helped me out so much by coming on the show helping with the alexander culty episode i'd love to see the audience get involved in this project and help you document things that they might be near so maybe tell the listeners how can people contribute to extending this catalog of ancient sites that you're working on at megaliths.org? Yes, definitely. Just submit new sites. It's very easy. It's a very easy submission form, very small. And yeah, this is much appreciated because it takes long time. I, I have many sites on file. I just can't submit them because, uh, I have garden, also I have to do videos <laughs> and things like that. I'm submitting maybe half of them. The rest is uh, user submitted. I was expecting that people will be much more active. Unfortunately, they are not as active as I expect. Mm. Now I'm planning to uh, make some videos available only for those who submit sites. Let's see if it will work. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. But I love it. And I, I will say also I'll back you up and say that the megalist.org site is the best catalog I've seen of ancient sites. I mean, you have so many different things I've never heard of. And we can talk about it all day, but you've got to see the pictures for them to really resonate. And you also have a section on the website that lists sites that you're looking for more photographic evidence of. You have them. You know they exist but you don't have the real person on the ground taking the photos and submitting them. And that would be a good place to start for people. If you just look at the list of uh, sites that you're still looking for photos of, and they might find on the map that they're near three or four of them, even I did, that would be the place to start. And that's how someone could contribute to what I think is pretty amazing work. Yes. Thank you. That, that I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Thanks. <for it. laughs> no worries. And, uh, I also want to ask, are there places, where, where's the next expedition outside of uh, Italy now that you've been there? Is there another place you have in mind for the future? 
Uh, yes, in December I plan to go to Malta. And in spring I want to go to Italy again and Spain uh -huh. again. And maybe Turkey if it is peaceful. And I don't know if I can do all that. <laughs> <laughs> Malta is definitely fascinating. Land of giants, they said. And uh, most importantly, I hope this uh, winter to go to the Philippines and meet in person those famous um, surgeons that make surgery with, with their hands. You know, they penetrate into your body mm. and uh, take out things from inside just with their psychic powers. So that will be um, the next adventure after Malta. <laughs> Very exciting. Wow. Well, Sylvia, I always learn so much from talking with you and keeping up with your videos. There's so much we didn't get to talk about, but there's only so many hours in the day. So thanks again. Do you have any last words for the people before we go? Yes. The main reason for which um, I make my videos is to inspire people to develop their magical powers. Hmm. Fair enough. So hopefully <laughs> people will get working on that. <laughs> Awesome. Well, check out Sylvia's new 